Hello, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Monica Valentine from the Library of Congress. I'm here with Don Tate, whose featured book at the festival is William Still and His Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad. If you'd like to see Don's presentation at the festival, log on to nationalbookfestival.com. Welcome, Don. It's great to have you here. If you're ready, uh, we can begin our conversation. It's truly an honor to be here, Monica. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're very welcome. Okay, so uh, I'd like, first of all, to ask you about the book that we mentioned, William Still and His Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad. What inspired you to write this book? Well, it's interesting. Uh, my mom actually inspired the book. My mom is always sending me stuff because she knows that I like to write. She knows that I like to illustrate. And so she's always trying to give me ideas. So one day at a garage sale, she buys this book for me. It's called The Biographical Dictionary of African Americans. And she sends it. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do with this book? You know, because my book style, my book pack is starting to, you know, build up. And so um, I decided what, during Black History Month one year to start drawing some of the images, some of the historical figures inside. And then I came to that image of William Still. And I decided rather than to draw that image and put it out there on the internet, I'm going to save that story um, for myself because I was so inspired by the idea that he was the father of the Underground Railroad. Okay, that's interesting. So what would you describe uh, for people who haven't read the book about the major themes in it and how they relate to our world? So the major themes in the story are, of course, African-American history, um, which is so important. I remember when I was in elementary school, there simply wasn't a lot of African-American history taught beyond Dr. King and Rosa Parks. And I think that it is so important to introduce kids to a variety of, 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 of history. Um, the Underground Railroad system, um, you know, when I was in elementary school, the only story about the Underground Railroad system that I remember was, of course, the story of Harriet Tubman. And one of the things that really attracted me to the story of, of William Still is that I didn't know that William Still actually worked with Harriet Tubman. In fact, William Still actually funded some of Harriet Tubman's um, journeys into, into the Underground Railroad system. And so I thought that was an important story that that kids needed to know as they're studying the Underground Railroad system. And, you know, the, the topic of slavery. That's a tough topic sometimes in elementary schools. And I think that um, because the topic isn't often discussed in elementary schools that children, and particularly children like me grew up misunderstanding it. When I first got into publishing, I really wanted to avoid the topic of slavery because I was embarrassed by it. Um, I hadn't been taught much about slavery in elementary school. And I remember being in middle school and the movie Roots came out and everyone it was a miniseries actually, and everyone was talking about that miniseries. And the white kids were making jokes about how their ancestors owned my ancestors, and the black kids were making jokes about your hair is as nappy as Kunta Kinte. And so when I got into publishing, I thought, I just want to stay far away from the topic of slavery. But then as I started to research, some of these stories and slave narratives, I realized that these are important stories that need to be preserved um, because once children better understand, uh, better understand what happened, then they can realize that these stories are stories to be proud of because they demonstrate African American resilience and our, bil our ability to, to do great things even when we're facing the worst adversities. Wow. Do you believe that William Still and his uh, freedom stories appeals to a specific audience? And do you think about that audience when you're writing? Did you consider that audience while you were writing the book? You know, I, qu quite honestly, I really try not to think about the audience or who might be reading the story. I am simply trying to research to find out the truth in a story. Um, and to put that truth forward. Um, now, I did have to consider, because this story deals with some complicated subject matter. I mean, it does deal with the topic of slavery, and there are gonna be some young children who simply don't understand what is slavery. So I very 
uh, it was very important for me to introduce the topic in a way that was palatable for a five-year-old. Um, and then it deals with other things like, you know, like I say, the Underground Railroad System and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. You know, what does that mean to a five-year-old? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, you know, so, there is to, so to a certain degree, I have to consider the audience that I'm writing for. But for the most part, I try to focus on just telling the truth and sticking to the, to the truth in a story. Okay, okay. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your path to becoming a professional illustrator and writer of children's books? What inspired you to start down that road? Well, I've always been an artist. You know, when I was a kid, I was the kid who was, you know, I was not the kid who was outside playing basketball and kickball. I was never a sports kid. I was always drawing. I was always keeping my hands busy, making things and building things and braiding or macrame. So I've always been an artist. So I knew, you know, that I wanted to become some kind of an artist. I wasn't quite sure what that would be. Um, and then when I was in college, um, I had an aunt who was a young adult novelist. And one of her novels was made into a movie. It was called Just an Overnight Guest. And I remember when that movie debuted at the Des Moines Public Library. Um, and I went there and, you know, the important politicians were there and the newspaper people were there and all these important dignitaries came out to celebrate my aunt's literary achievements. And so I, you know, because I saw my aunt as a book creator, then I started to see myself as a possible book creator. And I thought one of these days I will tell stories too. Now back then I didn't see myself as an author. So I figured I will tell stories with pictures. And I, um, early in my career, I visited, um, I believe it was an International Reading Association conference. I was working for an educational publisher and I met teachers and librarians and other authors and illustrators. And I fell in love with the field of trade publishing and I decided this is where I want to be long-term. Now, it wasn't until much later in my career as an illustrator that my friends encouraged me to write. And I thought, I'm not a word person. I can't even get the words out of my mouth without my grammar getting all tangled up. So I wanted to stay far away from words, but then I started to write every day. And I started to discover that my writing, you know, as the, the more that I wrote, the better that my, that my writing, you know, the, the better that my writing got. And I realized that writing is just like painting a picture, but I'm using different tools. When I'm illustrating, I'm using paintbrushes and chalk and crayon. And when I'm writing, I'm using verbs and adjectives to, to create a picture. So what I've discovered is that today, I love writing just as much as I do illustrating. Wow, it's great that you had a literary role model in your own family there. Um, Amy asks, uh, hi, Mr. Tate. Whoosh is so popular with my students. Are the end pages with the plain I'm sorry, are the end pages with the plan illustrations based on Lonnie Johnson's real plans? Yes. Um, now that was a while ago, but I believe that Google actually has a search engine that allows you to find, you know, you can search out, um, you know, copyrights and you can search out who has, all of those images that are on the end papers are in that Google search. And any inventor who has patent has, has, a, has a patent out there, you can go out there and search that and find the actual patent with the drawings. And so I based my illustrations off the drawings that I found in that Google search. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Okay, we have another question regarding research from Elise. What kind of research did you do for this book? And what was the most fascinating thing you learned about William Still that you didn't know before? Well, what the, in the, in his entire life uh, was, was totally new to me. The primary um, source that I used was his The Underground Railroad, which is the stories that he documented. Um, and then within The Underground Railroad, in a later edition, he hired a biography, James P. Boyd. So there is a short um, you know, biographical note. And so I relied highly on, um, on that biographical note. I also used things like um, 
You know, I have an illustrated, let me see, this is an old Philadelphia photographs from 1839 to 1914, which helped inform my, some of my illustrations. Um, there are actual etchings of William Still and his family out there on the internet. So I use, I use uh, many of those. Um, I think the most interesting thing that I learned was that William Still funded many of Harriet Tubman's, um, you know, excursions. I didn't know that. And I, I remember it was about, I don't know, this time, a couple of years ago when that movie Harriet came out. And I rushed out to watch that movie because I wanted to get an idea of how, you know, the, 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 the director visualized um, that time period. And, um, and I used some of the, you know, visual imagery from that movie to inspire some of the images that I created in my own in my own story. So I often tell kids that there's so many ways that you can do your research. You can use books. You can use the internet. You can use the library. You can go to the movie. Um, there's documentaries. Um, I remember one time I was illustrating the book about Duke Ellington, and my grandfather was a huge Duke Ellington fan. So I called my grandfather and I interviewed him and he sent me every single Duke Ellington LP that he owned. And I was able to use that in much of my research. So, so many different ways to research a children's book. Yeah, so many different mediums and formats you can look in. Um, okay, here's a question from Cleo. Since you said uh, you read nonfiction as a kid, can you give some ideas of how to get kids to choose a variety of nonfiction? Did you just go from shelf to shelf or did an adult give you guidance? Um, I would say the most important advice that I can give you is to let the kids pick their own, what they, you know, what, what they want to read. Um, and that is one of the things that, you know, my mom pretty much, you know, my mom pretty much let me choose the books that I wanted to read. There weren't, there weren't a whole lot of books in the, in the house that I remember. But when I went to the library, my mom would have never told me not, you know, this is not the type of book that you can read. One of the things, if you have kids who are visual like me, I encourage them to read graphic novels. And I've, I've heard where some parents and you know, teachers discourage graphic novels, but graphic novels are a wonderful way to introduce children to, to literature. So Jerry Craft's New Kid, um, is you know I keep hearing that's like one of the one of the country's favorites right now. Um, so yeah, just it, it's it's just important that kids be allowed to pick out their own books and pick out what they want to read. Okay, since we're on the topic of kids, do you have any advice for any kids out there that might be considering careers as writers or as illustrators? Well, the most important advice that I can give you is probably really boring. Um, but it is the best advice that I can give you because it is the advice that was given me when I first got into the business, which is if you want to be a writer, you have to read. And you have to read in a way where you're studying the various ways that, 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 that writers are writing. Maybe you want to study poetry and study the way that, an, that, a, that a poet uses rhythm and rhyme um, to make the words engaging. Or if you want to write novels, you'll want to read a lot of novels. If you want to be a you know a graphic novelist, you have to read at least 300 graphic novels. Um, and if you want to become an illustrator, get yourself a drawing tablet and draw in that tablet every day. If you love drawing cats, draw cats every day. Or if you have a hard time drawing hands because hands are hard to draw, Guess what? If you draw hands every single day in every single position, you're going to get really good eventually at drawing hands. So the best advice that I can give you is to use that talent and to polish that talent, whatever it is. And even if it's, you know, maybe you want to become a singer or a dancer or, you know, a rapper, whatever that is, you just have to polish that talent. That's great advice for young people. Okay, this next question comes from Tennille. Thank you for choosing to write these stories. What advice would you give to teachers on how to incorporate these powerful stories throughout the year versus just Black History Month? So incorporate the stories throughout the year. Um, you, you know, it's important to, you know, take a look at um, websites. I am the um, co-creator or co-host on the, the, book, the Brown Bookshelf which was established to help 
highlight some of these stories written and illustrated by African Americans. Um, check out sites like We Need Diverse Books. There are so many um, of these stories because oftentimes what I'm hearing is there's not stories that feature children of color. And I would say, yeah, there are. Um, they're just not as easy to find. So check out some of these resources. Um, another one of my friends, her name is Cynthia Lydic smith She has a website with all sorts of children's literature resources um, and, a, and a blog which features many new voices um, and, and as well as voices of color. So check out all of these resources. And um, yeah, so then the most important thing is, I mean, you said it there in the question that you have these materials, these books in your library, in your classroom and in your curriculum throughout the year um, in addition to, to Black History Month. Okay. One of our guests asks, do you believe in the saying, you can't be what you can't see? If so, how do you strive to impact representation and inspire others towards their fullest potential? Well, I most definitely believe that, yes. And what I had been doing before the COVID hit was visiting elementary schools all throughout the country. I remember one time I visited an elementary school and there's the kids were really excited. The kids are always really excited that morning. The, the, the school library just buzzes. And I entered and a young white child walks up to me and she says, are you the author? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, I didn't know authors could be black. And you know, she was not trying to insult me. She was not trying to be offensive, but in her world, if she doesn't see African-American authors or have African-American authors in her library, then maybe she didn't know that an African-American could be an author. So my mere presence at an elementary school or the presence of my books, which feature African-American faces um, in your library, um, that is how children can see themselves. And I think that it's so important that when a child reads a book, about an African-American historical figure or about any type of a story when they can turn to that jacket flap and see on the back page that the story was written and or illustrated by an African-American person that allows them to see themselves as being a future author or illustrator, much in the same way as I grew up with a famous um, aunt who was writing children's books. I was able to see myself as a book creator through my aunt. Interesting. Okay. Um, we have a question from a third and fourth grade teacher, Karen. She says, you've touched on this a little bit, but she says that she has a student who's watching right now named Emerson. She loves to read, write, and draw. Do you have any other advice for her and young authors who would love to, who would also love to illustrate? Who would also, so is it Emerson? Emerson. Emerson, I would say here's one of the really fun things is that most illustrators today are not using paper and pencil. They're using what's called, you know, they're drawing on their iPads or they're drawing on what I use here is called a Cintiq. And I'm sure you probably don't have a $3,000 Cintiq at your house, Emerson, but what, which, what you probably do have is an iPhone like this. And there are lots of drawing apps that you can download to your phone and learn to draw with your finger on your phone. And that's one of the cool things. When I, I remember when I was learning how to use Photoshop many years ago, got on the internet in one of those chat conversations and a 15 year old kid taught me many Photoshop tricks. And you can do the same thing. Get in there, learn how to draw on your device because if you're aspiring to be some type of a commercial artist in the future, you're going to need to learn how, to, you're going to need to know how to use those devices. So learn how to use, the, learn how to use them today. Okay, that's great advice, Emerson. Um, Steve asks, what was your favorite story about William Still that you couldn't mention in the book? My favorite story that I couldn't mention that's a, that's a good one. You know, I, I don't know that I would have shied away from any of them. Um, I think that when it comes to telling a story and even telling a story for kids that, you know, that we'd be honest with our readers because these things actually did happen. 
Um, of course, there are going to be some things that we're not going to want to talk about in children's books, but I'll tell you the story that I put in the book and the reason why I put it in the book, and that was, um, I spoke about Henry Box Brown. And I remembered that story. I grew up hearing that story of Henry Box Brown. And there are several children's books out there now about Henry Box Brown. And I was shocked to discover that the reason that we know about Henry Box Brown is because Henry shipped himself right to William Steele's office. As a matter of fact, William was right there helping to pull the top of that box off when, when, when um, Henry you know, popped out. Um, but how come I didn't know that? And so I thought, wow, this is a, one other reason why William Steele's story needs to be told because he made it possible for so many stories that we're unfamiliar with to be, to be told now, to be familiar with. Okay, uh, let's see. Here's a question from Panfilo. You're both an author and an illustrator. What are the challenges for each process and what guidance are you able to give the illustrator when you're in the role of the author? Uh, okay, repeat the question again, because I, I was thinking as you were talking, just, you know. Sure, sure. Give me a second. Let me get back to it. Hmm. Well, the question was that you are both an author and an illustrator. What advice yes. can you give to an illustrator who is in the role of an author? Um, so the, re the main thing to know about an illustrator is that you are telling your story. Okay, so you'll want to read the author's words, but then you're not simply using your drawings to decorate that author's words. You are extending the story. You are putting information into the story that the author could not put into it, the story. The author only has maybe a thousand words to, to use. So a picture book uses very few words, and so you can imagine the struggle that the author has with trying to put all of the details into the story. Well, guess what? The author doesn't have to put all of those details in because the illustrator can decide the colors. The illustrator can decide what's happening in the background. The illustrator can illustrate the setting and the time period and the hairstyles and the clothing. And so you'll want to be sure to do your research so that you can include all these details in the story. Um, and as well, the illustrator really is kind of the author because you you are using your drawings to, 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 to tell a story just as well as the, as the author. And what I've discovered, and I think I've said this, before, I've already said this before, but dr drawing is, is almost like writing, but you're using different tools. You're using visual tools to tell the story. That's great insight, okay. Desiree asks, as an artist, do you struggle with self-doubt and or motivation? If so, what lessons, wisdom have you learned over the years to combat that? So I will begin with the lesson. And the lesson is you really have to blot out all of the stuff. Okay. I, when I first got into the business, I used to always, you know, struggle with self-doubt. And I probably should say I, 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 I still struggle with self-doubt. When my book publishes, when William Steele and his Freedom Stories publishes, I worry about things like, what are the reviewers going to say? Are they going to say nice things about my words and my pictures? Or are they going to say bad things? They're probably going to say negative things. And then I start to worry about that. Then I start to worry about, well, will my book win any awards? And when my books don't win those awards, sometimes I feel bad and I think, well, maybe I'm not as good as some of the other authors and illustrators out there because I didn't win these awards. But what I've had to learn is that the most important thing that I do in my work is I do the best that I possibly can. I do the, I create the best possible book along with my editor and along with my art director that I possibly can. And once I put it out into the world, I have to be satisfied with knowing that I've done my best. And if those reviews don't come along and if those awards don't come along, that's okay because I've done what I can do and I know that I'm good and I, I have learned to appreciate uh, my contribution to children's publishing. 
All right. Well, here's some praise for your work. Jane Martellino says, I would love to hear more about the making of No Small Potatoes. I read it to all K through five students. Such an inspiring story. So yes, that was a very fun story to illustrate. And that was one of the few stories where, see most of the time when I work with a publisher, I do my sketches and I submit my sketches to my publisher and, and, they, and or to my art director and editor. And they say, mm, this works, that doesn't work. Then you go back and you revise. And then you send it back to them and they have their comments and you go back and revise. Sometimes I'll revise my books 10, 20, 30 times. This publisher had so much confidence in me that I submitted my sketches and she says, wonderful. And so then I went to my final artwork and I did my final artwork and I submitted the final artwork and I figured, oh, there's gonna be a bunch of revisions and they said, we love the artwork. There was not one revision. So this was like one of the coolest projects that I could ever work on. Um, one of the things that I pointed out in that story, and I have to be careful because I'm trying to remember the details. I have lots of books that I'm juggling. Junius Groves at one point in that story took out a loan or borrowed some money to buy some land, I think. And at a certain point, he pays the landowner back. And when I created my sketches, I thought, so this story would have happened shortly after the end of slavery. Therefore, the landowner was most likely a white man. And without doing any research, I created a white man. Before the book went to publish, I thought, well, I don't want to get that wrong. And maybe I should do a bit more research. And I reached out to the author and I said, who was this landowner? What did they look like? And what I learned is that this landowner was a Native American woman. Wow. And so I thought, wow, that is an important detail that does not need to be overlooked in this story. Because oftentimes, Native Americans have been erased out of our history. Mm -hmm. And so I made sure on that spread to illustrate, you know, Junius shaking hands and doing a deal with that Native American woman. Wow, thank you for sharing that story. Um, Brian would like to know, how many books have you written? Oh, I've written way more books that have gotten published. Um, I would say you, you gotta remember most of the books that I write, they may or may not go on to get published. But so I would say that I've probably written books that are still sitting on my desktop that have been unpublished, maybe 30 books. 25, 30 books and, and many, many, many more ideas that haven't been fleshed out and finished. Because sometimes I'll start to research an idea. I'll find a story that, oh, this is a wonderful idea for a story. But then when I do my research, I realize there's not a real story there. There's not many details there. I can't really tell the story, so it doesn't go anywhere. So I would say that I probably have about, oh, I can't, I'm going to guess here five or six books as an author that either have either published or are going to publish in the next couple of years. Well, like I say, I have, I have a whole desktop full of ideas that haven't got published, so. Well, that's a great lead into our final question, which is what's next for you in terms of next projects from one of our guests? Well, I will quickly mention two projects. I am um, illustrating a series of books called Roto and Roy, which is the story of a helicopter superhero, and I should say two heroes, a firefighter and a helicopter who are superhero, a superhero duo. Um, and I will, won't share the details, too many of the details there. I just look forward to sharing that story with you. The very next book that will publish that comes out next year is the story of Ernie Barnes. He was a football guy who became an artist. When he was a kid, he wanted to be an artist, but all of his friends said boys aren't supposed to be artists. So he became a football player and he became a really good football player. But guess what? Football didn't make his heart happy. And so he eventually, after five seasons of football, he left and he started to paint. And he painted that famous painting behind the television show, Good Times. 
Oh, and wow. I remember when I was a kid, I would watch the TV show Good Times and I would see those credits and I would see that painting. And what I didn't know is that Ernie Barnes, an African-American football player, actually created that painting. And that book will come out next year. It's called From Pigskins to Paintbrushes, the story of football playing artist Ernie Barnes. 